This is a production of Cornell University Library. Okay, well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone. Uh, for those of you who, who don't yet know me, my name is Sarah Wright and I am the Interim Director of Mann Library. It's my pleasure today to kick off the first book talk of Mann's Spring 2021 Chats in the Stack series. We have a wonderfully large audience with us today and I thank you all for joining us. As many of you likely know, today's talk is part of the library's Cornell-wide book talk program. Further book talks planned for the rest of the semester will touch on a rich diversity of topics from the history of Islam in Asia to the challenges that climate change is likely to pose for the food we eat in the coming decades. We are also featuring a poetry reading as part of the program as Cornell's Nobel winning, Nobel prizing, prize winning professor of chemistry, Roald Hoffman presents his newest book of poetry in celebration of National Poetry Month in April. For a, for a look at the full book talk roster and schedule, please use the link that we present in the chat box on the right of your screen. And before introducing today's speaker, Dr. Carl Pillemer, I'd like to mention a few logistics. First, our event today will include a question and answer period directly following Dr. Pillemer's presentation. We invite you to send us your questions by typing them into the chat box. You can type your questions at any time during the session today. And once Dr. Pillemer has concluded his formal presentation, our Q&A moder moderator, Evelyn Ferretti, will read the questions presented in the order that they were received. For those who prefer or require closed captioning, you may turn the closed captioning feature of the session on using the CC toggle at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and last but not least, uh, both Dr. Pellimer's presentation and the Q&A discussion are being recorded for publication on Man Library's YouTube channel. It should be available for viewing by mid-February for anyone who may have missed this event or for those that simply want to enjoy it again. And now on to our speaker. Dr. Carl A. Pillemer is the Hazel E. Reed Professor of Human Development at Cornell University and Professor of Gerontology in Medicine at the Weill Cornell Medical College. An internationally renowned family sociologist and gerontologist, his research examines how individuals and their families develop and change throughout their lives. Over the last five years, he has been conducting a program of research on the topic of family estrangement and reconciliation which he will talk about in this presentation. A book recently resulted from that project, Fault Lines, Fractured Families and How to Mend Them, which was published by Avery this past September. Dr. Pillimer has authored five other books and over 150 scientific publications and speaks throughout the world on family issues. Dr. Pillimer also created the Cornell Legacy Project, which is dedicated to finding out what older people know about life that the rest of us don't. This project led to two books, 30 Lessons for Living, Tried and True Advice from the Wisest Americans, and 30 Lessons for Loving, Advice from the Wisest Americans on Love, Relationships, and Marriage. Mann Library has had the honor of hosting Professor Pillemer for talks about those books in 2012 and 2015, respectively. We are thrilled to be featuring Professor Pillemer for his new presentation today, and I ask you to join me in giving him a very warm welcome. Well, it is such a pleasure to be here and I'm going to try the scary moment of sharing my screen. And my hosts, everyone is seeing that as they should. Can you confirm? Okay, great. It is an incredible pleasure to be here. No, I feel like I've had sort of a man library trifecta um, with having been able to talk about each book here and the feedback has been extraordinarily useful. And I'm especially glad to be able to talk about um, this book and the project which led to it because it really was a Cornell effort. There were students, both graduate and undergraduate involved in the data collection. I had a fantastic honor student who interviewed about 40 of his peers um, so we could get a picture of estrangement as it affects college students and emerging adults, a donor, uh, a gift, uh, from a donor, helped to fund the research. So it's, although I'm giving talks about this elsewhere, it's very special to give it here because of how Cornell related this was. And, and thanks to everyone for coming. I think there are some folks in attendance who may have been involved in the study and I hope I have conveyed uh, 
the kinds of information you shared with me like you would like to have it be conveyed. So I'd like to begin by uh, telling you an anecdote. Uh, you probably read the Christopher Robin stories. Uh, and if you're of a certain age, you've read them to your children and to your grandchildren. And so you know that uh, they're about a little boy and his menagerie of sort of quirky animals and his adventures and misadventures with them. You probably also know that Christopher Robin Milne was a real person. His father, A. A. Milne, wrote the stories uh, which were based on his stuffed animals. Uh, and that occurred, they were left alone in the summer as his mother was traveling. And so to keep him occupied, he wrote these lovely stories and the woods near their house became the Hundred Acre Wood. So you would have every right to think that this warm and loving relationship between father and son persisted throughout their lives and it would be a wonderful story. So in fact, uh, from a beginning as a young adult, Christopher Robin Milne was completely estranged from his parents. He eventually was completely estranged from them. Um, he was famously quoted as saying that my father got to where he was by climbing on my infant shoulders. He filched from me my good name and left me with nothing but the empty fame of being his son. He was also estranged from his mother, um, so much so that his mother refused a deathbed reconciliation with him. Now, why didn't you know that if you didn't? Uh, you know, why would that be something uh, that wouldn't be common knowledge? Well, uh, um, the reason is, and one of the first and most critical findings of my studies were how much people who are involved in family estrangements experience a sense of shame and isolation as a result of it. So over and over, I heard from people uh, how shameful they found it to be, how stigmatizing, how if you told people about it, it's not something they would ask about. They envisioned in a way a cartoon bubble over people's heads when they said, my son and I don't speak to one another, or my brother and I haven't talked for 15 years, they imagine one of those cartoon bubbles saying, what's wrong with you? Um, and this is a quote um, from one of my respondents, which was very typical. He said, there's been many times when I felt like I have the worst family situation ever. I know that's not true, but when I've had some irrational moments, I think that my situation is the most bizarre, the weirdest that could ever happen. And he then said what a lot of the people I interviewed said, if only I could hear from other people who've had family complexities like this, it would help to know that I'm not alone and that every family has issues. And I would certainly be able to let them know that they're not alone if they heard my story. So, and so that was a very common feature of this experience. In some of our interviews that I and my research team conducted, this was the first time that some of the people had really told anyone maybe outside of their most um, intimate associates. So one of the things I wanted to do in this project, if it accomplished nothing else as I began to work on it, though, was to bring the topic of family estrangement out of the shadows and into the clear light of open discussion and dialogue. And to the extent that it does that, I'll feel like it's been successful. Um, I do want to say a word about where I got here, how I came to this topic, because people often asked. Um, I've spent a lot of my life studying families, and if truth were told, a little bit of, of time, or, you know, I would say that one of my foci has been on what some might think of the darker side of families. So I've done studies of conflict and abuse in families, including elder abuse, um, of families under stress, in particular the stress of family caregiving. I've done a whole series of studies on the effects of parental favoritism. But one area that brought me to this topic probably more than any other, there were studies that my colleagues and I have done about ambivalence in families. How our feeling about our family members to use the trident to expression is often this can't live with them, can't live without them. So all those primed me for interest in this topic. Um, and then one thing really brought me to it, um, and that was in interviewing older people, which was mentioned in the introduction. Um, I spent maybe 10 years interviewing some of the oldest people in America about their advice for living. And one of the questions that we asked everyone 
is what are your major regrets and what can a young person do to get to your age of 80, 90 or 100 and not have regrets? I will say that one of the things that almost everyone did say is if you get to 100 with no regrets, you probably haven't lived that interesting a life. So, you know, that's something to think of. But I expected when I asked about these regrets to hear about big ticket items, uh, a, you know, an affair, a shady business deal. I was not prepared to hear so many people talk about an unresolved estrangement though with their own parent, though with a child or with a sibling, as one of the greatest regrets they had at the end of life. And these were often some of the most emotional discussions I had. So that primed me as well for it. So I began to look into the literature. I began to try to understand it. And there were some things I learned. One is it was clear even from anecdotal evidence from people I talk to, just from everyday life experience, that this problem probably touched millions of people. And from reading things online, the few anecdotal accounts certainly causes people very profound distress. It's certainly a major topic on the media and on the web. You can see it to this very day with the issues in the royal family, with Meghan Markle's uh, famous estrangement from her father, uh, um, and on and on. This often reaches media attention. What was striking then was how little guidance exists for people in estrangements. There's only a very limited self-help literature. And even a book like the monumental doorstop size handbook of family therapy doesn't have an entry for estrangement. So e even though therapists deal with it, uh, with some exceptions, it's not something people are are necessarily trained around. And what struck me the most as a researcher when I started is that only a handful, fewer than a dozen academic articles had ever been written on this topic. So I began to ask myself, like in what world does this make sense? How can it be that a problem like this isn't being studied? And that led me to this series of studies. Um, I'm going to go quickly uh, for the social science junkies among you. If you want to ask questions in the uh, chat, that's fine. But I do want you to know how these studies were done. So, um, so the overall name of the project is the Cornell Estrangement and Reconciliation Project. And uh, we defined this, I would say, conservatively in the sense of that we didn't want a lot of gray areas around it. So we asked people about a situation in which they were cut off or a family member had cut off contact entirely. So this real sense of I'm done. Uh, in this hyper-connected world in which we live, these were situations where there was as close to no contact as possible. Uh, there were several interlocking studies and it's sometimes a little hard to keep track of them as I'm talking, but let me give it a shot. One of the things I really wanted to know was how extensive is estrangement? So is it a media hyped problem? Is it one of the silent epidemics that we keep hearing about over and over like, um, as we're doom scrolling? Or is it a really serious problem? So I did the thing that a good sociologist does. I conducted a random sample survey of over 1300 um, Americans. I won't go into the details. Uh, but it used aggregated web panels to closely replicate the national population of, of adults over 18. Then independent of that study, but we now have actually accomplished about 300 uh, um, um, in-depth qualitative interviews. Um, and that was a mix of um, convenience sampling and snowball sampling. So we started with lists of all our associates, had people, you know, either volunteer or recommend others. And then through snowballing, we found more and more people. Uh, I was also greatly assisted by our local um, a celebrity, Amy Dickinson, AKA Ask Amy, who actually uh, put in her column that we were looking for successfully reconciled individuals. So overall of those around 300, but we have a hundred people who had successfully reconciled. So it's the largest study of estrangement and reconciliation, and certainly the largest in-depth interview study of people who have reconciled after years or decades. We also had additional written accounts. And the goal here 
but was to take advantage of the wisdom of crowds, not just to have a few anecdotes, but have large and representative samples. Much of what I'm going to tell you um, with one example, uh, uh, exception comes from this large scale in-depth interview study. One thing that happened to me during the course of this project, and it's very relevant to what I'm gonna to talk to you about, um, the study started out as a study of estrangement. So the way I asked the questions were, are you estranged from someone? I can, I can share that later. And by the time I'd gotten through a whole bunch of those uh, interviews, so well, let's put it this way. I had a title for a book, uh, Fractured Families and How to Mend Them. I knew an awful lot about fractured families and very little about how to mend them. And I began to have a couple of interviews with people who had reconciled and their experience of estrangement had been incredibly similar and sometimes even worse than people who had stayed in estrangements. But this process of reconciliation for them had been a transformative experience and really shed a whole new light on it. So I did move, uh, I both continued to study estrangement but also included people who had reconciled. And in particular, I mean, I wanted all the other data that we collect, but from these hundred people who had successfully affected a reconciliation, I wanted to know, how did you do it? What, what, um, what enabled you to take this step or to sort of heal the fracture in your family, albeit often imperfectly, that others have not been able to achieve? So, you know, I tap these, the, the expertise of what I call the real experts. And, and that became the, the unique uh, focus of this project. But we can discuss later. I do wanna be clear, because invariably people raise this, certainly not saying that everyone should reconcile or that it's right for everyone, but I did wanna profile people who had done it and understand how they had made this shift. So now in a little bit, if you're as old as I am, you remember the movie, If It's Tuesday, It Must Be Belgium, which was about a European tour where you stop in a country for less than a day. And that's gonna be a little bit of this. I am relying on the book. And so there is much more detail uh, provided there. Uh, but I did wanna give you an overview of some of what we learned because this for me was really academically the most sort of interesting research and intellectual journey I've had. And so it's exciting to be able to share some of it. So there are four questions I'd like to try to touch on. One is the question of how much estrangement is there. So is it in fact a silent epidemic or is it just some limited but very dramatic cases? A uh, second briefly, how do people get there? Uh, so what did we learn? learn I wouldn't call it the causes of estrangement because whoever can figure out exactly what causes a problem like this is due for a Nobel Prize or its equivalent, but we did look at life course pathways into it. Uh, then the experience of estrangement and one of the sort of discoveries of the study was estrangement as a form of chronic stress. Um, and then I'll spend a more of the time that I have on pathways to reconciliation. What did people say they did uh, you know, to make this happen. So here's the survey question we asked uh, in the national survey. So I'm not talking about the in-depth interviews here. This is a national random sample survey of people, uh, of adults. So we asked, do you have any family members so with examples from whom you are currently estranged, meaning you have no contact with them at the present time? And you know, people sometimes in, the, in, in what little literature there is talk about emotional estrangement or maybe situations where people are distant. But we really believed, and I certainly believe, that there's something qualitatively different between a poor quality relationship where people are still interacting. And when someone says, as many people heard these very words, I never want to see you or speak to you again. This relationship, mom, dad, daughter, son, brother, is over. That, that struck us as qualitatively different and that's why it was worded this way. So, you know, before I go to the next slide, I would ask you to think yourself, what seems like the right number? What percentage of people would answer yes to this question? And I was prepared for high numbers. I wasn't prepared for 27%. So over a quarter of a random sample of Americans saying they were currently estranged from a relative. 
So translated to the US population, that would be around 67 million people. About 10% of the sample was estranged from parent or child, about 8% of the sample from a sibling, um, and 9% from other close relatives. The one discovery of the study was how painful it can be to be estranged, say, from cousins who you grow up with, say, being very close to, or a grandparent or an uncle. So numbers don't usually speak for themselves. Um, in this case, I would say here they do, you know, in the sense that this is obviously a significant problem for quite a few people. I just want to briefly touch on pathways to estrangement because we have so little time. But, but these were six common features of a history of estrangement. So these were common answers to why did this estrangement occur? First is the long arm of the past, that there are people whose experiences of harsh parenting, uh, whether it's actual abusive behavior or just you know, parental favoritism, extreme sibling rivalry, serious problems in the family of origin, even if the relationships got better for some people were unable to be overcome. Divorce in childhood was another important aspect especially with uh, the non-custodial parent who turned out uh, more frequently, of course, to be men who often create new families and disappeared somewhat from family life. So divorce and its legacy was a factor in estrangement. Uh, it appears all the time on TV shows from everybody loves Raymond to the Simpsons to whatever you watch, but the problematic in-law in estrangement so was a very strong factor that people Mar that there's a person who marries into the family who either distances uh, the daughter, son, or whoever is getting married from the rest of the family, or a hostile uh, relationship develops between the family of origin and the family of marriage. Money may not be the root of all evil, but it's the root of a lot of estrangements. Uh, arguments and fighting over wills, anything where there were zero sum issues around money. So for example, even if parents divide their estate equally, you can't divide the grandfather clock that was brought over 200 years ago from Germany or that chipped you know, platter that served the family turkey on Thanksgiving for 60 years or a house that can only be divided if it's sold. So this, there were also problems in businesses and family businesses. Value and lifestyle differences also emerged strongly. And in other research I've done with colleagues uh, using other data, uh, we found that strong value dissimilarity between family members, uh, also lifestyle differences at different approaches. Um, but we may have time in the Q&A to talk about politics um, are a factor. And finally, unmet expectations. We have very, very powerful expectations for family members. Indeed, families are sometimes built around these. So, you know, the feeling that my, that my siblings ought to have my back, my father or mother should have put me first in their lives, all kind of, one frequent situation, which I think, which we may come back to, is issues around family caregiving for older parents. Uh, there was a real precipitating cause. And there were cross-cutting themes throughout the estrangement, excuse me, throughout the estrangements. One was um, anecdotally, if you speak to people, very often they have a signature event. I refer to them in the book as a volcanic event because one of my um, respondents had described that when I asked why is a trivial event so important in estrangement, he said, it's like a blocked up volcano that can't explode and the lava comes pouring out of the side. Um, um, quite frequently, a single turning point event that's transformational is pointed to. Others sometimes encourage or discourage estrangements. Um, and when people want to reconcile, they sometimes are held back, say, by their siblings. How can you possibly talk to our father again after all he did? Collateral damage is another theme, and we learned that heavily from our college students how profoundly affected they are, say, from their parents' estrangements, from uncles or, or you know, their own grandparents. And finally, an undercurrent of anxiety, and this is borne out by some family therapy research, that 
People, when someone says, I never want to see you again, often attribute it to anger or to hostility. In fact, we learned that there often is anxiety, anxiety at being drawn back into an old family role, anxiety about being criticized. So I would, so those were four cross-cutting themes beyond the individual pathways. I just want to touch briefly, I probably don't need to convince you that estrangement is painful. But there is a question as to why it's so painful. After all, you know, we live in a world where if you go online, you'll read studies about the end of the American family and anything goes and friends as family. But the, we found that for many people, even if intellectually they believe that this is the best thing, it's quite a painful experience. Um, and one of my interviewees really put this in a way that's strong, but wasn't atypical. She said, I have a scar on my breast from breast cancer. I have a scar on my breast from breast cancer. Okay, it's healed. It's a scar. But the estrangement is an open wound. Every day I have to wrap myself and insulate myself and protect myself because it's an open wound. You can't change it. It's still there every day. You can't recover from it. I'll tell you, I went through rape. I went through breast cancer. It's a piece of cake from lose, uh, compared to losing a child like this. Um, and that really were common strong sentiments. I'll, I'll just touch on three reasons why it is so painful for people that we uncovered. One are you know the biological historical bonds of attachment where we develop ties to people who we grow up with and are significant aren't easily broken even if they're no longer physically present. Uh, estrangement typically involves rejection. And, and there's a lot of social psychological research on the effects of rejection, showing that it's more painful than a number of other stressful events because it's so damaging to our self-esteem. And finally, and I think very interestingly, are the aspect of uncertainty about it. Pauline Boss, a well-known family researcher, coined the term um, ambiguous loss, by which she means um, a situation where someone is absent in a physical sense, but psychologically present. And that's the case in this estrangement situation. There were people who didn't wish their relative had died, but affirmed that it would have been easier, that they would have known how to deal with it. Uh, you know, they would say here, there's no funeral, there's no closure. It's just uncertain because the relationship could start up again. So in my remaining time, just checking how much of that there is, um, in the next sort of 10 minutes or so, I, I'd like to talk about what individuals, these hundred individuals or more who had successfully reconciled, going through and synthesizing what they told us, what did they say are some pathways to reconciliation? Um, the, one of the strongest pieces of advice, and I would venture to say unanimous or as nearly unanimous, uh, you know, as anything in the study, uh, was giving up aligning two separate pasts. So the, it, the, what I noted both from our research and from research on psychological narratives is there obviously is no one account of the past. We develop narratives, say, about our childhood, about past hurts, uh, um, about past difficulties that are extremely powerful. Uh, and we are invested in them and we gain allies in talking about them. So one of the things I learned is people who reconciled abandoned the idea that the two paths would align. And if technology allows, I'd like to show you a video from a mother. These are um, interview material from a mother and son in the same family. Uh, and uh, it gives you an idea of how hard it is to align the past. I feel like I've done everything I can to show that I'm a loving, caring parent. But my kids don't seem to think so. None of this makes sense to me. I mean, I always ask myself, what part was abusive they went to good schools. They did extracurricular activities. There was always good food on the table. Where's the disconnect here? 
you know, we didn't have alcoholism. We didn't have physical abuse. We didn't have any of that in our family. They don't have any reality check here. And if the parent tries to bring in that side, it's just, no, you're negative and a toxic parent. Instead of the reality. When we were growing up, she lied all the time. She's manipulative. After about age 25, I just didn't want anything to do with her. Neither did my sister, but she was more tolerant of her than I was. I had just had enough. If you met her, you'd think she was nice, but everything was in service to her needs. She wasn't like a normal mother. Yes, she was involved with us, but she was so narcissistic. You just get so tired of it. The reality of our lives was that she put us in the hands of an emotionally abusive stepfather, and then she detached herself from that reality. Um, so that gives you a sense of the power of our narratives. And a couple of things that people argued was, for one thing, they argued that abandoning the need for an apology was critical in most cases. And in fact, the person often apologized after the reconciliation had taken place. But there was a strong sense of that life had to be lived forward that an attempt to impose one's view of the past on the other person was doomed to failure. After 30 years, th there isn't gonna be an agreement on whether um, a sibling was just doing harmless teasing or being emotionally abusive. So over and over, it was, it, it was very difficult for some people, but that's what they gave up. Um, a second pathway to reconciliation was asking the question, to put it simply, am I really not to blame at all? And I wanna say a word about this. I noticed a fascinating thing in the interviews where I uh, often they would begin, and this was more common, I will say, among parents of estranged children, but not only among them. Uh, the, you know, the person would say, I have no idea why this happened. Really, I, ha I have no idea why this occurred. It just came out of the blue. Then as an hour long interview progressed, they would recite a litany of past hurts, conflicts, difficulties, problems in the relationship, disapproval of their, uh, you know, of their son or daughter-in-law, let's say. And then they would come back and note that they had no idea why it occurred. They would describe letters uh, that were sent to them by the estranged other but it was all lies. Now I talk in the book of this concept of, of defensive ignorance. It's not someone's fault for feeling that way, really. It's that this is so uh, punishing to one's identity to, to become estranged that people do develop these defensive barriers. So, so again, almost everyone who reconciled came to some kind of an understanding of the part they had played in it or at least to deeply examined it and found out that they hadn't particularly. Uh, so one person told me, um, Lois, who was in her mid thirties, why did it work out after such a long estrangement? Well, the most important thing I did was I realized uh, what part I played in it. As long as you think everything is the other person's fault, you're never gonna have any kind of communication. So if you wanna reconcile, you have to understand that and stop throwing blame totally on the other person. In fact, drop blame altogether and say, this is a situation and this is what happened and accept that. 
Um, uh, um, uh, just a couple more quickly, so we have time for questions. Um, uh, uh, the elimination of expectations I've touched on, but you know, there's a famous line that circulates around the internet that in this case, our research found was true, um, namely that uh, expectations are disappointments waiting to happen. And it, there, are, there are very few situations in which people have more powerful expectations. So a desire for their family members to perform in certain ways. One of the key insights that people came to was that their family member was not going to change after 20 or 30 or 40 years. That uh, their parent wasn't gonna be the responsible parent they had hoped for that their brother wasn't going to step up and take care for their aged parents because it wasn't in his or her capacity. Um, and, and here's an example because caregiving came up frequently. Um, Janice told me that when my parents were ill, my brother refused to help me care for them. I became very angry with him because he was easily within distance to help. I decided that I was no longer gonna speak with him. We reconciled in large part because I learned to accept his limitations. It doesn't do me any good to expect anything more from him because it's just not there. I would tell people that you may have to just let go of your expectations for the person. And it's liberating. You stop wasting emotion expecting something that's not going to be there. Um, and finally, I just wanna to touch on this question of boundaries. I have set clear boundaries here, but actually the, the uh, individuals who reconciled I would almost state it more clearly as setting clear terms. So they often reconciled in the context of offering one more chance. So a person had been asking and asking and asking to be let back into the relationship and they offered one last chance. And when it succeeded, it was on very clear terms, you know, down to, and, and I will add the other finding of this was that the other individual had to ask themselves the question, what's the least I can accept? So an adult child might say, you can come and visit, you can't stay in the house, you can come once a month and see the grandchildren and your second husband can't come here with you. I don't wanna hear about him. Or you can come if you don't criticize my partner or don't tell me how to child raise or, or various issues like that. There, um, but there was a large range, but there were very clear terms set and very strong boundaries for self-protection. And so the last quote I'll share with you, I think, is uh, but this was a man, Anthony, who had struggled on and off in relationships with his parents. And he said, I made specific plans, and this is when he reconciled, for how I would handle the stressful side of the relationship, like limiting the time I spent, especially with her, um, or with his mother, I always kept a little distance, a protective barrier between her and me. I needed the buffer and I was never going to allow myself to get sucked in. So carefully establish your own boundaries. A boundary is like a fence around you. It protects you. It's a sacred space where you can be you and you will not let the person come in and violate that space. Um, I wanna close with what for me was a very surprising finding. Um, and I want to again note that one chapter in the book is, are you ready to reconcile? And there are people who aren't. There are also people who may be in situations that are dangerous or, or if not actually dangerous in a physical sense, emotionally dangerous to the person. Um, as I talk about in the book, attempting reconciliation in that case is certainly best done with the help of a mental health professional or, or counselor. In many cases though, that didn't fit that description. Estrangement turned out to be a striking engine towards personal growth uh, and one that was um, you know, strongly articulated by people. That, and it, it almost came out in the sense of, of a discipline, like a discipline like learning a martial art or running a marathon. People understood that it was a process, a process where you try, fail, and perhaps try again, that has imperfect results. But for a lot of individuals was, on the one hand, one of the most difficult things they had ever done. And on the other hand, because it was one of the most difficult things that they had ever done, they described it as a transformative personal growth experience, 
along the lines of, as a number said, if I could do this, I could do anything. Also, many of them found that during the estrangement, it was impossible or very difficult to grow in some aspects of their lives because the relationship wasn't active, it wasn't real, it wasn't something they could process. Um, another reason why it felt like a personal growth experience was the, what I call in the book, anticipated regret. That it's a weight on people's shoulders and especially in a time like this, say during the pandemic, people become worried whether the chance to reconcile will never occur. One of my favorite quotes was from a man who had been estranged from his brother for 25 years and finally gave him a call. And he said, the next day I woke up thinking, this is the first time in 25 years, I haven't wondered why I'm not talking to my brother. So they experienced it as a liberating experience for uh, um, um, in that sense. So when people ask me what was a surprise about this study, it was this, and, and I'm not you know, preaching in this sense, but this is what I learned. So uh, one place to find more information about the studies is at uh, this website, www.familyreconciliation.org. Uh, we do have uh, some stories that people have shared. And if anyone is interested in sharing an estrangement or a, um, a reconciliation story, you can do so there. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. So we have some time for, uh, for uh, questions and I'm gonna stop sharing at this moment. All right, thank you so much, Carl. This is- um, um, and Tell me all of that came through technologically and I wasn't just, you know, talking to myself. Yeah, it came, came through on my end, I think, and I got, had no, um, no complaints That's from the audience. So yes, so thank you. So, such, such important um, things for all of us to think about. So my name is Evelyn Ferretti and I'm here to moderate the questions. And there have been a number of questions that have come through and I'd like to remind everybody that you can, Pose your questions via the chat here on the um, the chat panel, and so we definitely are accepting more questions. And there are have already been a, uh, quite a few that have come in, and I will get started with the first one. This one's from Suzanne. Her question is about the presumption that reconciliation or ending estrangement is optimal. In some situations, might this be unwise or even impossible? What about circumstances where one or more parties experienced trauma due to the family dynamics? There's a second part to this question. She has also. Similar to an effective mediation or reconciliation process, isn't it necessary for all parties to be genuinely to genuinely commit to a careful and caring process? With a deep history of betrayal, resentment, fear, how is it worth the risk to re-engage with family members perceived to have behaved, behaved harmfully in the past? So two questions. Um, that is a great question. And it's one you know I frequently get, and I, I, I'd like to answer it in a couple of different ways. One uh, reason why the, you know, the findings of the project and the book are as they are is because you know, it's really based on what people told me. So it's not you know, either my um, own opinion or my clinical impression. It's you know, the lived experience of people who've been through this. And that's one place to where it comes from. Uh, I would say, first of all, you know, the questioner is absolutely right. This is a highly individual decision. And I'm not making a normative statement that everybody should reconcile or even that most people should. Uh, I think it's a highly individual decision. As I say in the book, there's a chapter about trying to think about if you're ready or not. What I did learn is that reconciliation of some kind is possible, albeit imperfect, for lots of people who thought it wasn't and that those people experienced what they perceived as great benefits from doing it. And many of them had had past trauma or past difficulties or pretty much awful relationships. Uh, so that's one point. Um, another piece is the question of mutuality. I wish I had a better, clear answer. I can say though, that from studying people who reconciled Many of them gave up the idea that the relationship would be processed. Um, um, and just to give an example, many people initially began by wanting an apology. When they looked at their own thinking though, they didn't want an apology for a single event. But they wanted an apology for their entire childhood or for who the other person was as a person. 
And abandoning that, many of them said, well, I wasn't about to apologize either. I, you know, I, it, 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 you know, I have the same intractable viewpoints. So I would say, and it's a great question, people gave up this sense often that there had to be mutual understanding of the past and bridging every past hurt. For successful reconciliation, they were much more likely to start at the present um, and plan a future. And even if it wasn't entirely comfortable, th th that was necessary for most people. But let me underscore, a strong recommendation in the book is to get counseling of some kind prior to attempting to reconcile, especially if it's a highly emotional situation, um, and to have the kind of support that you would need if it's rejected, if it doesn't work out, or if there are problems. So I, I do uh, um, appreciate that question. It's really important. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and I apologize. I think I was typing away there, and I apologize if if uh, if um, if that was a uh, if that came in came through. Uh, next question is from Rick. I'd be interested in hearing Carl talk about the role of anxiety in causing estrangement. So there is a school of family therapy called Bowen Family Theory or Bowen Theory, though which influenced some of my thinking, and I recommend people to look into it who are interested, where their clinical experience was borne out by the in-depth interviewing we did. So that when you talk to individuals, just to expand on what I said briefly, about why they believe their relative is, you know, has estranged him or herself from them. They do typically believe it's bad feeling, hostility, anger. They often will use terms like narcissism or selfishness. Um, and what the interviews often uncovered was this underlying deep current of anxiety about the relationship with the other person and about the family. So that their reluctance to re-enter the relationship, to attend a family gathering, to go to a wedding or a funeral, was profoundly anxious. And it was described often as being pulled back into sort of a maelstrom of family relationships that they didn't feel psychologically equipped to deal with, even if there was no particular danger. So, so that really did emerge. Uh, and, and I think it's helpful for people if they have a relative who has become estranged from them, to understand it in that way and try to understand the relative's uh, perspective. Of course, there is anger, hostility, you know, painful aspects of relationships, but I would say that this was a you know, profound undercurrent of a lot of the interviews, and it seems to be borne out by some family therapy experience. All right, thank you, Carl. Next question, and a lot of questions have come in, so I'm not sure we'll have time to get all of them, but we'll give it, give it our best shot here. Next question is from Lawanda Cook. What are some of the most often, what are some of the most often reasons given for estrangement? I'm especially curious about siblings who may distance from sibs with disabilities, especially as they age, for fear that they will be expected to provide care. That That is a very interesting question and one that I hate to use the old saw, but it's one I would like to think about more because in terms of the relationship between adult children and parents, there was a strong proportion of cases that resulted from conflicts over caregiving and someone's reluctance to provide care or perceived inability to do so, that it was simply too difficult. So I think that that may be a factor where there is an anticipated care need that there could be some distancing. And I can't say that you know, definitively, but it would be worthwhile to go back uh, and check you know, our data to see if, that's, uh, um, if that is a piece of it. Yeah, yes, in terms of sibling estrangements, they were more likely than other relationships to involve a certain amount of growing apart. Um, you know, among siblings, they're close together as children. And then there's often intimacy at a distance until they're brought together again by needs for parent care. So, so one issue is this reactivation of, of, among siblings when there's a problem, and that's one piece of it. So we also did see among siblings a higher preponderance of this issue around 
value differences of someone adopting a lifestyle that was disapproved of, um, and not even lifestyle issues, but also um, mar quote marrying the wrong person. Um, issues of sexual orientation in some cases came out um, among siblings that had to do with these value differences. So I would say that might have been a bit stronger. And I think the idea about the role of disability is an interesting one that we should look into. All right, thank you. Next question is from Vandana. Hi, Carl. Did you find that those who re reconciled had some something in common in terms of their personalities? For example, that they were not all as angry, more sorrowful as those who did not reconcile, or that they were more introspective, perhaps? You know, this study could not, it'd be a great next study to look at personality differences. Uh, and uh, that's something we'll have to think about. You know, at best, I could give sort of an overall impression, which is that from the experience of these interviews, personality differences didn't appear to be a key factor in, in reconciliation. You know, you would expect from the research literature that people who have more of these positive personality char characteristics, maybe like conscientiousness or um, extroversion might be more likely to reconcile. I think it was very often changes in life circumstances which occurred. One thing you have to remember about estrangement, I was always fascinated as a child by the scene um, in Sleeping Beauty when she pricks her finger and everyone in the castle freezes in position so the musicians are frozen and the dancers, et cetera. That's, that's really what estrangement is like, is if all communication is really broken off, what people don't see is the other person changing, growing, developing. Uh, and often with sibling relationships, th there were events and difficulties that caused the estrangement. And over the course of 10 or 20 years, people learned that, that, the, that, that the sibling from whom they were estranged had changed. So I think uh, that was often a characteristic that there would be a change in situations that encourage siblings to realign. No, that's a good question. Great, thank you, Carl. Next question from Lisa. Are there specific therapeutic approaches that you found to be helpful in helping people either come to peace with estrangement uh, to find reconciliation? Sorry, I'm not quite so sure I get that. Uh, listen, I'm not a, a, a clinician, so I, I very hesitantly make recommendations, but I will say that an interesting place to look is the Bowen Center, B-O-W-E-N, because that particular school of family therapy has focused in part on what it terms cutoff, which, which I would call estrangement or estrangement is a part of it. And individuals trained in that school of therapy are typically more attuned to thinking about um, estrangement and reconciliation. One thing that a number of family therapists did tell me, I should add that we did a survey of 60 family therapists as well. Um, so I, did, I, I don't talk about that in the book, but we surveyed family therapists uh, in academic settings who were training other family therapists. Many of them used their current techniques. However, they typically viewed it as a tremendously difficult barrier the inability to get both people into the counseling situation. And that is very typical in, in estrangements that the person, especially who's initiated the estrangement, isn't really interested in counseling together. One of the things which both therapists and the reconcilers told me is going by yourself is still valuable. On the one hand, you may be able to process this and accept it as a loss and learn to cope with it. But by going through a therapeutic experience on your own, you can more closely tap, for example, the role you might have played in it, what might be sustaining the uh, problem. In some cases, it's tremendous if both partners can be brought together um, in a therapeutic relationship or in some kind of counseling. Finally, it doesn't have to be counseling. Individuals also recommended more straightforward mediation. So in, in situations where the cause initially was a money problem, financial problem, they actually resorted to mediators or other people who could help with the immediate situation. I think most family therapists are able to deal with this issue. 
And one thing to do is to ask them um, if you're seeking out help for this, whether they believe that they can you know, help you with it or whether there's someone they know who specializes more in this kind of estrangement and reconciliation. Carl, there was a question about how you spell the name of that, the therapy. Well, B-O-W-E-N, it's a school of family th um, systems therapy or, or like a theory that the, was developed by someone named Murray Bowen, B-O-W-E-N. Uh, there are various centers, but there's a center in DC called conveniently the Bowen Center that I'm pretty sure can refer people to um, local therapists. And I will say it's permeated, you know, eclectically family therapy in general. So I think a lot of family therapists are, you know, aware of that perspective and um, able to use some of the insights. And again, it's not a clinical recommendation, just from, I found that uh, connecting with individuals in that orientation was helpful in understanding our research findings. Great, thank you. Next question is from Jess Jessica. What would you recommend for someone that is not ready for reconciliation, uh, for reconciliation, where the estrangement has been recent, but who may be worried that time is running out, for example, aged sick parents? So I, uh, I don't mean this to sound, you know, glib or, you know, sort of pop psychology or, and this is really the kind of information that people gave. Um, individuals entered what I would call sort of a contemplation stage. And it sounds like, you know, that's the questioner. Um, and this is so what we know about, you know, decision-making in general, you know, is that often people experience a contemplation stage where they're thinking about it a lot, where, um, where the idea comes up. And so that's one thing that I would attune to is do thoughts about reconciling. You know, does it come up? Um, often people would get sort of a nudge. It's as they became aware of it, they would hear a sermon, read a book, go to a workshop on forgiveness, uh, you know, um, read a story that, that then that, that really captivated them. Um, and then they found they were thinking about it a long time. Another thing which people who were ready to reconcile often reported was what I referred to earlier, an increasing sense of anticipated regret. If I don't at least try this, I will later regret it. But which led to one important finding I would add in that context. People in my study did just what that questioner did. They thought about it and tried. And if it failed, they felt much more resolved about it. So, you know, the attempt, this one more chance idea, which led to no reconciliation, left them feeling much better about it. So again, the people paid attention to those nudges. I would say the final thing that may help you decide um, is if you begin to develop a plan. Um, so when people really edge towards reconciliation, they, they found themselves talking to other people. What will I do? You know, I want my partner to be with me when I make the phone call. I, uh, you know, uh, they began to think out. If, if, if I try this and it doesn't work out, so what will, you know, what, what I'll do. So there was sort of this, com this contemplation stage into a plan that really helped people, uh, you know, decide if they were ready to reconcile or not. Great question again. And these are terrific questions, by the way. Thanks to all of you. Yeah, they really, they're really fantastic. Uh, I had one from Maureen. What is the potential for reconciliation when one of the parties has done the reflective work and is ready to move forward? Yeah, I think it's stronger. And let me take that question a bit larger. I, I should have said only one of the parties. So only so that, yeah, it's only one of the parties. So I, I, you know, I'm just going to have to be really disappointing. You know, I, I wish as a result of five years of study, I had an answer um, for what to do if you're ready to reconcile and the other person isn't. And because the estrangement by definition involves stonewalling, so your attempts are thrown against a stone wall, uh, you know, and there's no communication back, even if you're ready, even if you've examined your own motivations, you feel better about it, uh, you know, you understand what you've done wrong and you want to convey it, a, a person may simply want to stay in it. 
So far, there aren't great solutions to that, uh, which I'm guessing is what the, you know, that question is implying. I asked many people about it and they argued, they recommend the following, don't give up, continue to reach out, you know, like not in an invasive or obviously or stalking way, but to send cards to, um, uh, you know, if there are grandchildren involved and the person permits it to send them, you know, to communicate with them, communicate with other people who are sort of intermediaries um, with the other person, expressing a sense of openness to the reconciliation is one of the strongest things uh, that people did. Um, and, uh, you know, this issue of, you know, like again, without being invasive, uh, but seeking other people's help, there were a number of individuals who threw another sibling or threw, a, threw another one of their children were at least able to convey that they were strongly interested in reconciling. But there, you know, it's very hard to batter down that stone wall. And the only real solution people gave was persistence, willingness to admit one's role in the estrangement, if that in, in, indeed did exist, uh, and to try to understand what the terms and boundaries the other person would accept to be back in the relationship. But yeah, that's the most challenging situation. And I wish I had a better answer. Thank you, Carl. This is another question from the audience. In what situations is it recommended to not attempt to reconcile? And if not reconciling, what advice is recommended for a better life individually apart? So I had wanted to deal with, so again, not to be pessimistic, I'll, I'll start with the sort of pessimistic piece first and then become sort of more positive. In talking to people in permanent estrangements, whether they had originated it or whether they hadn't, or at least in apparently permanent estrangements, the advice for coping was very, very similar to the advice for coping with any stressful life event or loss. There were not a lot of other ideas around how to overcome it, you know, besides counseling, therapy, accepting it as a permanent loss, moving beyond it, you know, distracting oneself, people find, you know, establishing other relationships, other friends as family. Uh, the, there were parents estranged from their children and by extension, their grandchildren who became involved in the lives of other young people. But there wasn't a magic bullet for how to cope but with an ongoing estrangement over which you personally um, don't have control. On the positive side, though, many did find that the kinds of coping mechanisms and treatment, so to speak, or therapy for perseverative grief, uh, you know, were really helpful for them. So various kinds, again, of psychotherapy, stress reduction, dealing with their own coping skills were, were positive for them. Um, but there wasn't no um, special, you know, uh, here's how to cope specifically with an estrangement. I will add too that for many people, um, online support was a double-edged sword. Um, there were a number of people who either went, especially with parents and children, who went to Facebook groups for estranged parents or Facebook or Reddit groups for estranged children and found that it, some found it very helpful, some found it just reinforced their own feeling of, of depression and hopelessness, uh, especially because they aren't moderated, you know, in a therapeutic way. So I, I will say there were some people who found the very helpful support online and others who found it a mixed bag because people in those online groups were so angry at the other uh, person, if you go into a parent support group online and a child support group, like so many areas in our culture, you enter sort of two different universes. And I give examples in the book for how different those worldviews are. So I, I would suggest to people look at online support, but also be very careful uh, in monitoring their own responses to the kinds of interactions they have there. Carl, the next question is about uh, one of your statistics there. Does your 27% finding include the other party estranged or just the key person identifying estrangement? Wouldn't the well, number then be double? 
Yeah. So, right. It's an interesting statistical question that we, uh, that I talked with other family scholars about, um, right. The, should that be doubled or not? The answer is for reasons I can't quite go into, probably not, but, but, but the answer is yes, it could be a person who was uh, themselves estranged or, you know, or had been estranged from another person. So it wasn't, you know, dyads. Um, I'd like to take that opportunity to mention something that also may have occurred to people. I'm often asked, well, okay, 27%. Were those people though who just drifted apart or their sons moved halfway around the globe and they just aren't in touch much? And the answer was pretty much no. So we, so I, I, I asked a follow-up question, whether the estrangement was upsetting. So, you know, are you upset by it? And uh, the, um, the findings only changed by a, by a relatively small amount. If we looked at people who said, I'm not upset at all, it, it drops down three or four percentage points, but it's still, you know, so really the numbers are still very high for people who say they are estranged and it's upsetting. Um, and we also didn't find uh, differences across demographic groups. So I know that goes beyond the questioner's question, but I wanted to toss that in. Carla, next question is from Emily. Hello, and thank you for the great talk. I was wondering if you have done research or can speak more on familial estrangements for family members who are not necessarily related by blood, i.e. who are, who, excuse me, how a divorce might affect extended family or how divorce after a long marriage might affect someone who is, who, is sim, who to a similar extent, I'm sorry, or how divorce after a long marriage might affect someone to a similar extent as a rift from a close family member. Right. You know, I'll, I'll say honestly, the study, you know, um, wasn't able to go into that. I did initially b begin by interviewing some people because I thought it would be an interesting aspect of the study or maybe another study of people who had become estranged from a close, very close friend. So someone who they considered to be like a family member. Uh, and from the small number of interviews that we did on that topic, it was very painful and very similar to the way people described estrangements from family members. Uh, there was a positive and a negative side to that. Uh, on the positive, uh, well, I mean, the, the, there were, so in, um, in terms of how that was viewed, on the one hand, it was, it was sort of harder to talk to people about it because people didn't take it quite as seriously, I guess. Uh, you know, they viewed people having falling out with friends, so it was hard to convey. On the other hand, those relationships were somewhat more reparable from the small number of studies we did. Um, in terms of blood versus stepchildren, that we simply weren't able to look at. It would be a great study um, as to whether blended families experience these kinds of estrangements more than others. Um, and we just don't have any data, but it's a great question for a future point. I will say that divorce, we certainly did find cases where parental divorce, because there are increasingly high rates of people getting divorced in their late 50s and 60s. They're one of the higher you know, divorce rate groups. And divorce and remarriage in that group, because the family's a system, did sometimes lead to difficulties with adult children, for example, that led to estrangements. Um, but uh, that would be a great topic for more study. Carl, this next one's a, a bit of a lengthy question. It's so uh, Lisa sharing, my estrangement is based on a highly toxic and cyclical relationship between my siblings and my parents. My sibling continues to, continues to make huge mistakes and refuses to understand the impacts of that on those around him. And my parents hold unrealistic standards and really expect to be heard and followed without question. They are both unrelenting and unwilling to hear other persons. I have chosen to keep in touch with my parents and let go of my brother, but I'm so conflicted by the continued fallout on the next generation who are now young adults. How do we keep a relationship with them without fe them feeling guilty, feeling guilt for keeping in touch with us while we don't have a relationship with their parent? And how do I build my relationship with them based on the turbulence of the past? Oh, that's such a great question. And I will, at the risk of sidestepping in a bit, those are issues that are dealt with really uh, 
really sort of in detail in the book, and it's a great op- this is a great opportunity to touch on a few of them. One, there is an argument for maintaining these relationships in what I called, you know, the collateral damage relatives. And the one of the sort of tragedies of family estrangement in say uh, the, the parental generation is uh, the severing of ties between cousins. I talk in the book about how um, we have a side of the family who we know almost nothing about because there was an estrangement in the grandparental generation. So there is this kind of seventh generation principle that you really need to think about what you're doing if you're initiating an estrangement because it does carry on into future generations who then may not have contact with one another. A number of people in estrangements who allowed or encouraged their children to be in touch with other children, uh, you know, in the estrangement, in the next generation, were extremely glad they did so um, and found it was very positive and found it was possible. Uh, I even had people in the study who were estranged from their own parents, but the grandparents had relationships with the grandchildren. Um, and again, that was positive for everybody. So I think, you know, a key thing is to the extent that it's possible not to have that kind of collateral damage is, is extremely positive and people find really, really worthwhile. The family system aspect of it, of individuals who are tormented by a sibling's relationship with the parents, you know, there's no easy solution except to try to separate the relationships as much as possible. Um, um, and that's what some people did who stayed together. Also for a situation of the sort of chaotic life of another person, a number of individuals did feel that psychotherapy was extraordinarily helpful in setting and maintaining boundaries. They, I think like the questioner, wanted some relationship to persist because they didn't want someone say who their children didn't know the existence of. And they really found though that therapy was profoundly helpful in, in establishing boundaries with a person like that and maintaining them. So I, I think from the studies I did, it's worth the effort, uh, especially not to have uh, you know, the, the enormous ripple effect in the family that estrangements can cause. Great, and so now we've come to our last question here um, from Donna. Do you have another book in the works? It's actually a fitting one for the last question. Do you have another book in the works? I love how you wrote the 30 Lessons for Loving after 30 Lessons for Living. What's your plan for the next one? I know I was sort of wondering, you know, like what's next? Is it 30 Lessons for Dying? You know, that seems like we'd covered just about, you know, everything. Thanks, and that's a great question. If anyone has any suggestions, please, uh, you know, email me. I, I'm still pondering some different ideas. Uh, one was, you know, lo maybe looking at the same kind of advice. What unites all three of these books, even though they're on different topics, is, you know, is the following. Maybe I can say this in closing. I'm, you know, my friends and family laugh at, be at me for being Mr. Evidence-based. You know, I'm always reading what the latest scientific study is and how they should change their behavior because of it. But I also believe very strongly that where scientific evidence is lacking, Asking people who've been through a life problem how they got through it, what their advice is for other people is our next best source. So treating individuals who've had the experience as true experts, and that's what I did with older people about aging, long married couples about marriage, and then people had reconciled about reconciliation. So since all of us are going to be dealing with end of life issues at some point, going to those individuals who are in the midst of it and asking not for their experiences, but their advice for other people um, is one thought. Uh, but, uh, you know, if anybody wants to email me with what they would like to, you know, of kind of who they'd like to hear from next, I'm completely open to it. And thanks for the question. Yeah, but right now, no next one in the pipeline for next year or something like that. And Carl, on that note, your e the email that we can put is at the reconciliation at cornell.edu. Is that a, yeah, is that so a that good would place? Be the best is right. Is it is it reconciliation at? Um, um, if you can, can type put that it in. in. I, I will do that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but that's the best one, you know, to use. Uh, you know, 
I personally get so much email that, you know, like all the rest of you do, that it may get lost in the shuffle. Uh, but if it goes to that site, uh, we'll know what it's about um, and can respond. Um, and my thanks to all of you, for all of you who've stayed through this. These have been fantastic questions. I'm going to get them um, from the chat, and we'll address more of them on our blog and, uh, you know, perhaps in some of the studies we're doing. So thanks so much for your attention and your response in particular. Yes, well, thank you so much, Dr. Pillimer, for that engaging presentation and discussion. And I, I suspect you're going to get a, a lot of emails with some suggestions for, for topics for books going forward. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of today's talk, this was only the first in a series of chats in the stacks for this spring. Uh, please visit the URL that's on this slide and it will probably be posted in the chat uh, to learn more about what's upcoming and uh, to register for those upcoming discussions. Thank well, you. I'm glad so I didn't oh. go after how to tell a joke. That would have really set the bar very high. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> thank you all so much. And again, thank you, Dr. Pillimer. This was, this was great. I, I hope everybody uh, has a wonderful evening and a wonderful weekend. Take care. This has been a production of Cornell University Library.